I heard that you were much more supportive of people getting into this world when they don't have the many thousands of euros or dollars to spend, and that's important, and especially coming from an, an Italian yeah, but television it's also like that you. Yeah, makers believe that if one of these economic instruments is sold, that they don't sell their master-made instruments, but it's completely different this year, yeah? But uh, I don't know. Well, cheers to oh, yes. this incredible <laughs> opportunity. <laughs> uh, the, the camera is also toasting here. Uh, ole! <laughs> <laughs> cheers! Uh. This is the Q&A where I'm going to ask my cello maker about some questions that you guys have brought up, but also I have, and maybe some other questions that are in our minds. So why did you start making, why did you get started? How did you get started? Why, why the world of this? Well, in my family, we always were doing things by hand. So craftsmanship was something quite important. And so at a certain point, and at a certain point, maybe 13 years, something like this, I wanted to play an instrument. Uh, and then somehow I slipped into guitars. I saw myself already on the stage playing great rock and roll. And so I made, first of all, an electric guitar. And then How old were you when you made that electric guitar? 13 years. 13? Yes. Okay. At that point, actually, violin was not really an instrument in my life. So when it happened during a concert that I saw a violin and I looked at it and I saw these ribs banded and things like this, the scroll, how it was carved, at that time I made already the pack box of a guitar, I could appreciate the whole thing much more. So this was quite one point. And with 17 years, I actually had the just do it from my parents. And so I came here to Cremona and I looked what's going on because actually the, the first idea was to make here a evening school for guitar making. But exactly that year, they, they quit it making guitars here in Cremona with this school. But at the same time, I saw other, making, other people making uh, violins and I was immediately attracted. So instead of wasting time, I immediately signed up for the violin making school. And there, I, to, to get into the violin making school, I had to talk Italian. And I was really bad. Because Italian is not your original language. No, my original language is German in Austria. So I had to study, study, learn Italian. And then I was attracted by the instrument itself. So I started to make my first scroll. And then in the autumn, I came here like in April something. And in the beginning of September, I had my entry exam and I showed up with my scroll, which was like Shanghai, my, my winning card, you know, my, my joker, because I didn't really talk that good Italian. So you just showed up with a scroll? <laughs> yes, I showed up with my scroll and then a little bit of Italian, you know. And so, <laughs> so they, they took me and it was my, my, my fortune. And so then I stayed here and I made the school and that was actually how I got into it. And, and once I finished with the school, it was obvious for me that violin making is my profession. Violin making is actually the basic of my happiness. So, you know, you can, I can buy a car and then I'm happy that I have it, but it's not a real satisfaction. While in violin making, I have a piece of wood I work on it and I carve my things and it gets, it pops up and I give it my personal touch and that really gives me full satisfaction. So this is something I really love. Your URL, violoncellomaker.com. You are the violoncellomaker.com. Yes. Not the violin maker, but basically the cello maker. Now that, that's a pretty tall order to, to command. What, what justifies you calling yourself the cello maker? The violoncello maker? Uh, you know, every single question I could talk for hours. I tried to keep it as small as possible. But now I'm 52 years old. I know I don't show it. But, um, <laughs> but one thing is, a, one, one thing is a straight line answer. through my whole life that everything I actually hate or I'm not good in, I turn out to be a maniac and I become really good in. So let's say in the beginning so I was a very not humble man. You're very humble. Yeah, well, very humble. Was not true. But in the beginning I was not good in sharpening my tools. 
And then I really turned out to be a maniac when it comes to sharpening all my poor uh, assistants and, and uh, apprentices, <laughs> they have to go through my sharpening lessons and uh, for every time they sharpen, I'm just checking how they do it and if they do it too much. And because I just hate to waste time in sharpening. I want it good as short and in short time as possible. And with the cellos, I told you already before in the workshop, I made my first cellos and I did everything as good as possible in the first years of my career and the cellos didn't turn out to be good cellos. I, I just, I don't know, I didn't get the, the point what I, I, I did some things wrong. So then I was probably, because of that, I was more open to new inputs, new ideas. What do you need to make the cello sound good? And uh, my name, Edgar Roos, certainly for me is the nicest words in my life, but for a customer who shows up in Cremona, Italian sexy cello, you don't dream of Edgar Roos, you know? So I had to recompensate that in quality on my instruments. And so in order to make them better than the rest of the, of the makers around me, I, I focused and I searched and I read books and I went to other makers in America, in Europe. I checked it out, I asked everybody how they do this and this and this and that. And so at the very end, I turned out to, to make, I think, pretty decent sounding cellos. <laughs> who are the cello makers that did the most for the cello? And who do you look up to of the, of the classics? We're here in Cremona. Well, in Cremona, uh, now I should say Stradivari, but it is not true. Stradivari made in, I think it was two years, he made all of the, his, uh, his eight or 15 the cellos. Era, yeah. And that was it. So yeah. certainly if I, if I happen to have a Stradivari cello now, I would also, uh, would, I agree that people are willing to pay millions, millions, 20 millions or even more. Uh, but still, the best cello makers are not here in Cremona. They were actually out of Cremona. So probably the, 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 the cello which gave me the most uh, uh, energy when I was looking at it was a Peter Guarnieri from Mantova. That was such a big, strong cello with thick layer of original varnish on top of it. And I saw it in America, I think it was in Baltimore. And the best sounding, certainly, uh, Domenico Montagnana from Venice. A lot of people think that you have to have an old instrument to have a good sounding instrument. And there are documentaries, there's one documentary I know of, where they did a you know, double blind test of some luthiers, it's in French, um, it's called the Mystery of the Stradivarius. And they took some, a music critic, a, a layman, a luthier, and, and a professional violinist. And they, they blindfolded the violinist, and he was there behind, so, he couldn't see what he was playing. It was blinded, so they didn't see what they were watching. And you don't, you're not told when you put, here's the Stradivari, so your ears are gonna like be biased. And when they all did their blind test in the end, it was unanimous. Every single one of them chose the modern uh -huh. violin. Would you like to know which one was which? Yes. The one you all liked was the Fustier. <laughs> It's pretty amazing that we were all taken in like that. There was one video and I'm happy for that video that now it's, uh, we have a lot of advertising for modern instruments. Uh, I actually I, I would love to see everybody buying modern instruments. This is for sure because I made them right now. <laughs> but you play on a cello of mine made in 2002. Mm -hmm. And the one I showed you today was made 2018, right? And when you were checking them out, we had a, di a difference. On one side, that one is everything perfectly adjusted, and in yours we have to do two, three things. But still, beside that, we could hear a certain difference. And this certain difference is exactly the point where I would say, if you are live in front of it, you hear it, and I appreciate it. So now saying that, all modern instruments sound better than an antique one, I don't really uh, agree. Uh, you really have to look from one instrument to another. Mm. 
And uh, it's, 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 it's more a, diff it's a bigger question actually, because usually people who can afford to buy an antique instrument, they say antique is better, so I go for antique. Mm. And then what are they going? They search for an economic, affordable antique instrument. And what do they buy? A lemon. Mm. because exactly that is what everybody wants and for little money for 20 30 or 40000 you just get lemons yes believe me it's not because i'm nasty but i i can see even here in town they sell like for 40 or 50000 euro german instruments without the label and people buy it yes. only because it's, it's because old. old but something with no name in and you don't know who made it is nothing worth it's just a german cello and that's it you know this is a saxe this has no real value and these made instruments big mass has a nice antique appealing but there's no value be behind that so if i would be uh, now as uh, somebody who's searching for a cello i would immediately go searching for a violin maker like me now or one of the other 160 or even in France, in Toulouse, there's so many nice maker around. Search for a maker, go there, you don't like him, search for another one, you know. Until you find one you can identify, you meet him, you see him working, you ask, it's already sold, not sold, can I try it when it's ready? Try it and buy it, you know, it's so easy. And then take a picture with him, it's, it's more worth than any certificate, you know. Pernambuco. Pernambuco. It's, um... Endangered wood from Brazil. Yes. And our bows are made of it. Carbon fiber bows. There's a great brand from Germany, Arcus. Um, 10,000 plus sometimes. Um, they're, they're S9. Carbon fiber bows versus Pernambuco bows. What's your thoughts? I actually, I always like the idea of, of, of new materials and innovation. I think that's good. It's a pity to see that they use Pernambuco for lousy bows. Like it's a pity to use ebony wood on lousy instruments. Okay. This is a problem. At the fair in China, how many bows they make and how many lousy bows for six euros you can buy a bow out of Pernambuco wood. It just, it hurts, you know? This is, this is like crime. So if you give them, the, child, the children, a, a carbon fiber bow, this works great, no problems, they can drop it, it doesn't break. I think this is perfect. And then certainly with a carbon fiber bow, you can at a certain level of price, you can beat with this S9, but even a, le a smaller S5 or something. You, for the same amount of money, let's say 5,000 euro, carbon fiber bow, 5,000 euro, uh, Pernambuco, very likely the carbon fiber bow is much better and has a stable quality, you can play outside, you don't have problems, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't use uh, off and, and and so there are a lot of advantages. What I don't like because of the uh, carbon fiber is that it becomes like a religion, you know. If somebody's playing with the carbon fiber, the other one's immediately say, I ah, have the fiber, I, saw, I can hear it sound so hard and it... I don't want all this talking about the carbon fiber. So the Chinese actually did it, that they make carbon fiber bows and wrapped with wooden uh, <laughs> that around. It's just, this is just the Chinese way how they do it. It's just great. And I think for students and, and most people, something like this, at least when you play outside, take something like this, cost little and it works pretty good. For sure, if you take a carbon fiber bow, don't buy it just on the internet and don't send it. From one to each other, there can be huge differences. So take it yourself in your hand, choose it, and if you like it and you feel that it works with your playing, then take it. And same thing certainly for wooden bows, but never just take it and that's it. For our instruments, animal glue is used, it's still used for the, you know, the binding of the pieces of wood, of the cello together. Yes. Some people out there, and it's a growing number of people, want to play a guilt-free cello. They don't want to play an instrument that an animal died in order for them to play. 
Could you justify why animal glue is still being used today in a, or when there's so much more technology out there? And, and yeah, just basically that, like. Well, we were talking like with uh, Sandro Azinari uh, in the consortium. He had this idea that we make an instrument like this. I, I like the idea. Uh, so you use animal glue? I use animal glue. Um, Do you know which type of animal? I was told rabbits and a cows. Rab a rabbit skin is something I like very much. <laughs> it's the light. The cuter the animal, it's, right? Yes, the cuter, the cuter the animal. The animal. But you, is there's cows. It's from cows. They're... No, it's not from cows. From, from, uh, from, from rabbits. Rabbits Rabbits mostly. But I know for your instruments, but I know for the general lower grade, there's also you can get it from cows. I, I don't know if it's cows or if it's pigs. Or, it's, I don't know. It's just it's bones and they cook them. and. They but you prefer rabbit. A rabbit because it's it's lighter in color okay. and it is stronger, but, no, not, but glue? not too brittle. But so why, this is a good glue? combination. Why did the cute bunnies have to die to make this beautiful challenges? That's a good challenge? question. Uh, I don't actually know what else I could use. While you were making me this question, and I'm completely red now that I'm killing these poor animals to glue my instruments. Can you give me a different glue? I don't, you know Because what? the key Maybe point is- Maybe you can give us a different no, glue No, the key because... point is you take white glue, but white glue, once it is glued, you cannot reopen it. Yeah, it would reopen because the glue didn't glue, but it's a different process. It's not the same process than the glue goes into the wood, cracks and pushes the two pieces of wood together. So it's a different way of how it's working. I think the, the, the white glue is, is more a, a thin layer of glue. Let's say a little bit like silicone, yeah? Mm. And then you, so you have wood, uh, white glue, and then wood. With the animal glue, you have actually two pieces of wood which you uh, put next to each other. Then you put the, 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 the hide glue or hot glue or animal glue which goes into the wood and by drying pulls the two pieces next to each other and once it is glued in case you would try to open it up it would not crack here but it would crack the woods it's so strong so it's stronger than the the white glue and now you say then take uh, super glue you put the two pieces and then pass by and you see me making the joint for your cello like this huh but the problem is that you also need a glue which you can reopen in case you need to open it again. And that happens on instruments pretty often. So you have to take off a rib, a lining inside, the joint, top and back how it's glued, the neck setting, the fingerboard, and, and, and. So I think this is important. Yeah. Where do you think the industry is going? You know, you're obviously a YouTuber. You're established luthier here in Cremona. You have a YouTube channel that's sharing the secrets of violin making and cello making. Where do you see the industry evolving? Where do you see the industry going in the future? The industry of luthiers. For sure, everybody becomes better. Everybody becomes better. I just think of myself, uh, 35 years ago, you just needed to make a violin and you just could sell it. Direction is more that factory or mass product quality will go up and single makers are not uh, pushed out of the markets and will be substituted by carbon fiber instruments or crap like this. Uh, it's more that the maker themselves have to focus a little bit more, slow down maybe, focus a little bit more and rethink their own way or way of working, what they like, and underline their, their own making in certain areas a little bit more, or which was in the past, you didn't have to think about certain things. You just made it and you made your living. This nowadays is not any more possible. So you have to know exactly what people appreciate, who are the people who come to you and what they want to hear what they want to uh, see, what you have to do in order that they're happy, the service you have to give them, you have to work on that one. And this is, I think it's, it's, it's good for everybody. Yeah. And uh, it becomes tight, but there's so much space. Just go once to China and see all these people playing 
in such a great way. And then you, they all learn playing on Chinese instruments. I'm so happy there are so many Chinese instruments. And many of them, really many, are looking and considering buying my instruments. And I'm very happy that they, they appreciate and they appreciate it extremely a lot. There is a belief that the only way to sound good on cello is to spend a lot of money. Not true. And um, what is your opinion about that? No, a good musician, in my opinion, is able to play on every instrument at the concert, yeah? It's not the instrument, it's you. It's mm, you, absolutely. yeah? You live here in Cremona, I live in France, and a lot of people cannot make that trip to their original maker, but they have the luthier in their hometown. How often should they take their instrument in for servicing? Ha! Good question. I would love to see them all every month at least once, but actually I don't have that much time. So to please, minimum. please stay home. <laughs> no, no, that's not true. But at least I would say, you know, if you happen to Cremona and you, you, you pass by with your instruments which you bought from me, I, I'm, I'm always happy. He did it and I'm happy and he's also happy and I'm sure he will be happy once he's back home. I say treat your cello like a human or your dog. How would you, or your cat, what you love. <laughs> Your thoughts uh, on... I agree completely with this. I also made a few videos on it and actually I talked more about how, to, right how here. to... Huh? So you can... I'm going to link it right here yeah. in your yeah. video. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, it is more about uh, flying, but actually now when I think about traveling, means also out of your lesson, going back home, car, uh, whatever, never leave your instrument on the sunlight. Uh, Further on, I would even recommend take a white case. I know it doesn't look that fancy than a black case, but a black one is at least 70 uh, degrees warmer inside than a white one. So that makes a difference if you just think inside is your baby uh, warming up. And the pack certainly cannot keep this uh, climate change, temperature, humidity change, whatever, in the case when it's exposed to sunlight. So I would just follow this uh, advice from uh, you and just stick on it. Keep it as, as your, your, your best friend. Uh, there's a discussion on Reddit about cleaning your instrument. Some people use alcohol on the strings. I am of the school that um, nothing but maybe a damp cloth touching your strings ever, ever goes on the instrument. What is your recommendation for those at home that want to clean their cellos? Now, I, I, would, I always love to see clean instruments. That shows already that you love your instrument. So playing and then just putting back, playing, putting back and never clean. I think this is a little bit tough. It is like cooking in your kitchen and never cleaning. Come on clean a little bit. But on the other side, you know, at the Varnish Seminar in the year 2000 in Puerto Rico, there was a guy showing a violin, a modern violin, which had a very strange white spot on the back. And that was made because the guy took the, vi the, the violin like this and then put it into a silk bag. And he did it every time. And every day he did like this. And so the varnish was consumed by these two fingers. So now you imagine if you would play every time and then you take a rag and you start cleaning every time you play it. It's certainly not good. I will also very soon arrive with a nice cleaning pro um, product which you can buy on my online store because there are so many very nasty, too aggressive products. And still, even if mine now will be the best on the market, don't do it every day because you just consume your varnish. Well, well, and so this is no... Well, when it comes to that, you still, you're a professional. If even I bought your professional cleaning product, I don't know how to professionally but apply it. Yes, but no, you can take a rag, then don't never put it on the instrument, certainly, please, come Who's on. Who's there to teach me? I, I will teach you. Okay. I, I will teach you. Look at my channel and okay. those tiny details. Put it on a rag, away from the instrument, and then slowly start cleaning. But you do that once a month once every two months, but not every day. With the strings, cleaning it with alcohol, I agree. It's the only and the most efficient way to clean your strings. Now, 
to avoid to clean it too often with uh, uh, or to clean it uh, wrong with uh, alcohol, after cleaning, after playing, just pass with your microfiber um, uh, rag and uh, that's it. And from time to time, let's say after a few months, you can also clean the strings, but at that point, please have your rag far away from the cello, put a little bit of alcohol on it, put down the bottle of alcohol far away of your instrument, then go slowly there and then clean it. Otherwise, you're just taking off your nice, precious varnish, and this is a disaster. So actually, it's a risk I'm not going to take with my, with your cello. With I appreciate, cello. but if somebody is talking and swearing about it somewhere on the internet, I, it's correct. I do it, but I'm a violin maker. You're a professional. But if you are at home and some, something happens because one of your children or somebody doesn't know and a flop and a. Uh, I think it's just a risk which you, when you do it, you have to know there is a certain risk, okay? Yes, and that's a risk so, some of us are not willing to take. So maybe it's better to, to follow his advice, but still I don't... I take it to the luthier okay. and yeah. they do the cleaning. I do the cleaning. We could talk forever, it's getting a little darker. I just want to thank you so much for taking <laughs> time for me. And I hope you love my cello because it is dirty. <laughs> and it's well so loved. Dirty. Actually, you, you, somehow you have to clean it because I, wipe it. I think it's in perfect conditions. And I'm happy that it is in such a good family and is kept in with a lot of uh, appreciation. And uh, no, it's, I'm, I'm very happy. Well, I'm glad that I was able to make this trek here. You know, later on this week, I'm going to get it back. I'll love to see what happens to it and we'll do a little more talks about little things like that but thank you again we're going to have some food here because it's been sitting here and yeah they're hungry food. you know <laughs> <laughs> thank you edgar okay so much for doing this and uh, you're welcome i'm happy thank you bye bye